everyone. Welcome to another chapter in the War Memorial's American Democracy Initiative. My name is Ted Everingham, and I'm speaking to you from the historic Alger House, which is the home of the War Memorial here on the shores of Lake St. Clair in Gross Point Farms, Michigan. We're joined tonight by two students from the Gerald R. Ford Institute for Leadership in Public Policy and Service at Albion College. They are Vanessa Rojo Merida. Wave, wave your hand at us so we can see you. Uh, she's a, a sophomore at Albion from Sotus, Michigan in Berrien County, my home. And Skylar Zink, who is a senior from Manchester, Michigan. Skylar, thank you. And thanks especially to Eddie Visco, who is the executive director of the Ford Institute at the college for arranging for Vanessa and Skylar to be with us tonight. Tonight, we welcome back A.J. Bain, a California-based author, journalist, and public speaker, uh, a regular contributor to the Wall Street Journal, and increasingly and deservedly known for his books. The books so far are Dewey Defeats Truman, the 1948 election, uh, and uh, the battle for American soul, uh, the Accidental President, Harry S. Truman, and the Four Months That Changed the World, The Arsenal for Democracy, FDR, Detroit, and the Epic Quest to Arm America at War, and Go Like Hell, Ford, Ferrari, and the Battle for Speed and Glory at Le Mans. But for the next hour, we'll visit with A.J. about his latest book. It's called White Lies, the Double Life of Walter F. White and America's Darkest Secret. It's an intriguing book. Now, if you have questions for AJ as we proceed, uh, please use the chat function in Zoom and submit them that way. So welcome back, AJ. Good to see you. It's such a pleasure to be with you all. Thank you. Your book was published in February, just a couple months ago. Positive reviews in the New Yorker, Washington Post, Los Angeles Times and elsewhere. I found it to be a fascinating book. Um, it's, it, it deserves all the good press it's gotten. It tells the story of Walter White, the man that you have described as the most influential civil rights leader of the first half of the 20th century. That's a pretty big billing. Tell us a little about the book. It is, it's a big billing. And I know everybody is immediately thinking like, well, how, that, how can that be so? because nobody, uh, you know, so few people have heard of Walter Francis White today. So how could he possibly have been the most influential, uh, you know, civil rights leader of the first half of the 20th century? And I think if you read the book, you will, you will come to the same conclusion without doubt. Hopefully you do, Ted, I see you nodding your head. Um, there was a scandal at the end of Walter's life and, uh, you know, a couple of reasons where quickly after he died is his legacy was lost to history. And it shocks me today how few people have heard of Walter Francis White. And uh, I think his story is really important. So I hope people read the book, yeah. Well, it, it, is, it is someone who I not heard of. I majored in history. I know you mentioned him in some of your earlier books, but I flew right past those. And when I read this book, and I, 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 I have read it, honestly have, um, I'm gonna read it again. I found it just an intriguing story. Walter White's story and your book uh, begin in Atlanta back in September of 1906 when he was, what, 13 years old. Tell us about that. Well, that's true. Uh, so Walter White is born, um, he, he's born into a family where his parents were of the last generation of Americans, of Black Americans who could remember the slave era from memory, who could speak about it from memory. Both of his parents were born into enslaved families and Walter identified as Black growing up. He went to a Black school, Black church. He uh, attended a, a All Black Atlanta University in a little bit, I think I'll show you a picture of his, his graduating picture from Atlanta University. Um, but his skin was white, his hair was blonde and his eyes were blue. And the reason why that is, is because generations of Walter's family, as many generations of slave families in America, were born through um, uh, relationships between slave owners who could do whatever they want with impunity and female slaves who had no rights to their bodies. So by the time Walter is born, 
he he realizes he's coming of age as a, a young teenager. He realizes he can live his life as either a white man or as a black man. It turns out he does both. But there's this quintessential moment in his childhood that you mentioned, Ted, where he witnesses the Atlanta race riot of 1906, uh, in which he says he's I think he said he said he saw 12 men killed. Um, and it, it was at this moment where he decides not only does he decide, quote, these are his words, which side I am on, but also that he's going to spend his life fighting for justice in America. Amazing story. Um, I, I don't. I, I can't imagine the night that he experienced and later in his life, many challenged whether that actually, some of that actually happened, um, but it certainly was a seminal mo moment in his life. Um, he decided who he was at that time, right? Absolutely. So there's this moment where he sort of creates his own mythology where he's uh, standing on the second floor of his family home and, uh, there's a mob of white people who are coming with torches. You can imagine this, the, the torches reflected in his eyes as this young child. And according to Walter's story, his father handed him a gun and said, uh, don't shoot until the first person, you know, puts his foot on our property and then keep on shooting as long as you can. And um, Walter, you know, he says, uh, I wondered what it would be like to kill a man. But he's, you know, he hears this um this mob coming for their family and he realizes how bizarre it is because the mob is made of these white people who are out to kill black people like him but his skin is the same color as theirs so it's this terrible moment of irony that launches him into this future as a maniacal crime fighter uh you know and someone who who um wants to do all he can to make democracy real in america this might be a good time to show you had some pictures that you were going yeah. to show to kind of illustrate this. And I'd like people to get an idea of what Walter White looked like. I think that's very important. Normally, I might spend as much as 40 minutes with the pictures, but uh, today we're going to go through them rather quickly because I want this really to be about our conversation today. Uh, bear with me. So this is what Walter White looked like. Here's the cover of the book. And I want to just say something really quickly. Um, we, we spent a tremendous amount of time to spend deciding what to do with the cover of this book because I didn't want to show um, uh, Walter's face on the cover because I thought it would communicate to people that this is a biography of someone you've never heard of and you don't really need to read it. So we wanted people to understand that this was a very dramatic story and some essence of what it would be about. So this is him as a young man. Um, you can see, you know, it would have been strange for some to, you know, meet this man and uh, ide identify him as black. And as a matter of fact, for many times throughout his life, he would play with his skin color in public situations to get people to do things. He was, he used his skin color to be highly manipulative, but obviously here he looks like a white man. This is his graduating photo from Atlanta University in 1916. He is all the way on my right. Um, I actually found this photograph. I'm the only person that Walter uh, relative who still remains alive uh, that I could find was a woman named Rose Palmer, uh, age 92, living in um, Atlanta. And age 92, not only was she able to get this photograph, she was able to scan it and email it to me. I was very impressed. But you can see Walter there, here in this photo, graduating from All Black Atlanta University. Um, I mentioned really quickly the 1906 Atlanta riot. This was a riot, a race riot um, that was reported all over the world. It was a shocking thing to happen, um, but yet in a way not so shocking because it was not as rare of a thing to happen as you might imagine to have a riot where many uh, black people would be killed and no one would ever be held accountable. Um, it, it was reported on internationally. This is actually the cover of a Parisian um, newspaper where this is before the age of photo so they would actually do these elaborate drawings but that's I'm just illustrating like how widely reported this event was and Walter was in the middle of it as a 12 year old. Uh, this is the man James Weldon Johnson who meets Walter and plucks him from obscurity in 1917. He discovers Walter at this rally in Atlanta and James Weldon Johnson some people ask you know the old question if you could have lunch with anybody in the world who would it be? This might be a good answer for me. I just found his character fascinating. He was 
a former diplomat, an accomplished poet, newspaper man, educator, song lyricist, uh, and all around really fun guy to hang out with after midnight in Harlem. Um, but he's the one, he becomes Walter's mentor and puts him on a national stage. W.E.B. Du Bois, the most uh, um, honored black intellectual of his era, arguably still the most honored black intellectual today, the first uh, black American to earn a, a Harvard PhD. He ran a magazine called The Crisis. So when Walter comes, I forgot to mention this, James Weldon Johnson is who brings Walter to New York to work for the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, which very few people had heard of at that time, but soon would become this juggernaut in American culture. So this said, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois ran the NAACP's magazine. Um, I show this picture because it's just to me an amazing shot. This is called the Silent Parade. And this is the parade that uh, put the NAACP on the map. And you think about the idea of protest today. This was new, this had never been done before. The silent protest of 10,000 people marching absolutely quietly and holding signs. Um, so this is the first time that, uh, that the NAACP's work was published, you know, talked about nationally. But at the same time this is happening, the Ku Klux, the modern KKK is forming. And there comes to be throughout the 1920s, this rivalry between the NAACP and white America, white supremacy that is organizing. This is actually a, a, a march in Washington, DC, 40,000 Klan members. And the Klan was becoming incredibly powerful at this time. So Walter gets to Harlem at the same time, it's the beginning of the Harlem Renaissance. So not only is he becoming uh, a cog, a key figure in the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, he becomes a key figure in the Harlem Renaissance, a famed novelist uh, through these legendary parties. George Gershwin uh, debuted Rhapsody in Blue on Walter's piano. Uh, this is, you know, Walter's parties, you would hear the verse for the first time from Langston Hughes, uh, from the poet's uh, mouth himself. So all of this is happening at the same time. Now, um, the first half of this book is really, a lot of it is dedicated to Walter White's undercover investigations. So starting in 1918, he conducts over 40 investigations. He's living openly as a black man in Harlem, but posing as a white man in the South. Anytime there's a racial incident, a murder, a violence, a riot, he goes down and gets the facts posing as a white man. So over 40 of these uh, uh, undercover investigations, he he undergoes and he, he publishes these his findings in national newspapers and magazines. And that's what really makes him suddenly quite famous. So this is the red summer of 1919 in Chicago, Walter's there. This is the now very, very famous Tulsa riot, the massacre of Tulsa in 1929, 1921. Walter White is there posing as a white man, investigating, getting the facts and reporting on them. Um, and so it's those investigations that really put Walter on the map. Now, the second half of the book really is about Walter throwing himself into national politics because he figures out that he conducts over 40 investigations of these murders and no one's ever held accountable. And this is the guy who becomes the inspiration for his whole future and the inspiration to change the NAACP and really make it a political organization and to throw it you know, into national politics. This is Clarence Darrow, who Walter meets um, in 1925. And Walter is so amazed by Clarence Darrow. He's an attorney like you, Ted, uh, that uh, he names his, his only son after Clarence Darrow. Um, and it's Clarence Darrow who, con who convinces Walter that the power, you know, black power in the future, it's in the vote and in the ballot box. And so Walter throws himself into national politics. He needs help. Um, now, in the 1930s, this is an important point to make, um, the Black movement was really kind of uh, fracturing, and um, uh, there was a lot of uh, embracing of the ethos of, of the Communist Party USA. Um, but Walter, Walter's real uh, goal was mainstream politics. He thought all roads ended at the White House. That's where he wanted to be. Um, and he couldn't get FDR in the 1930s to meet with him. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt becomes the key figure. She opens the White House door and introduces him to the president. And um, at this point, 
uh, I'll try to explain this very quickly, a very complicated situation. But if you were Black in America before 1932, you would vote for the Republican Party. You would vote for the party of Abraham Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln, who freed the slaves. It, it was unquestioned. That's just what you did if you could vote. And in many Southern states at that time, South Carolina, Alabama, Georgia, Black people were not allowed to vote. Texas and Louisiana, Mississippi, and we're still seeing this, this issue of voting rights uh, today, which is kind of shocking to me. But Walter has this idea. He, start, he becomes the chief executive of the NAACP right when FDR comes in, into office. And he starts telling his people, don't just vote for the Republicans, vote for the candidate who's going to do the most for our cause, because the Republicans are doing nothing for us. The Democrats are doing nothing for us. So we're going to launch ourselves into politics and we're going to demand rights. And he convinces FDR to get on board slowly. So in 1932 is the first time that a lot of Black Americans voted Democrat. And by 1936, a huge majority of Black Americans voted Democrat as they still do today. Uh, this picture I just wanted to show on the right is Thurgood Marshall. Um, as Walter's fighting in national politics, he hires Thurgood Marshall, this young attorney who goes on to be the first Black Supreme Court justice, to begin fighting in the courts. Now, they didn't use the term institutionalized racism at that time, but that's what they understood it was. They had to fight for voting rights, and they had to fight for education voting rights in the courts. So he brings on this young lawyer, Thurgood Marshall, on your right, who turns out to be an absolute genius. Uh, and that leads us to Harry Truman. So... Um, by the 1940s, late 1940s, Walter brings together this very important relationship with Harry Truman. And Truman was from uh, Missouri, and everybody believed he would be a candidate that supported white supremacy. And he, chose, he proved everybody vastly wrong. And so uh, th what you're looking at here is this famous moment where Walter convinces Harry Truman to come and address the NAACP. Never happened before that the president of the United States appears in, at an NAACP rally. And in the future, Harry Truman in 1948 becomes the first president to uh, campaign politically in uh, the spiritual home of Black America in Harlem, and he desegregates the military. So it turns out that Harry Truman, from you know, in, in terms of national politics, is really a key figure in launching the civil rights movement. Um, this is here. They're going. They're walking to the stage before the Lincoln Memorial. That's the the speech itself. And I think I have a little clip. I'll play this for you, and then I'm just about done, and we can continue our conversation. Let's see if this works. Hang on. One, two, three. I should like to talk to you briefly about civil rights and human freedom. It is my deep conviction that we have reached a turning point in the long history of our country's efforts to guarantee freedom and equality to all our citizens. Um, I just wanna say that that's probably the first time that huge uh, numbers of Americans ever heard the term civil rights before. Um, so, that gives you a sort of sense uh, of who these larger than life characters were and what the, the book is about. Well, they are larger than life to be sure. Uh, so when Walter joins the NAA, first of all, he, uh, because of some things that had happened in Atlanta, he was a charter member as I understand it of the Atlanta chapter of the NAACP and ends up, um, joining the national office in New York City in what, 1918. And the NAACP was nine years old at the time. It was brand new. Very few people had heard of it, very few. Um, and it was the work of W.E.B. Du Bois and the magazine, The Crisis. It was the undercover investigations that Walter was conducting that were you know, leading to these shocking stories appalling stories of things that were happening in America that people didn't know about and, uh, you know, getting people out there to want to do something about it. Um, and also the work of James Weldon Johnson, who I mentioned earlier. So they put the NAACP on the map in the 1920s uh, before Walter became chief, chief executive in uh, 1930. Yeah. And, and uh, an office he held really until what, 1955. 
shortly before he died, yes. as I recall. And, and as you have said, the organization changed its focus a great deal over that period of time. And uh, the, uh, as you say in the book, the modern civil rights movement probably started with Truman and the events that led to that speech in front of the Lincoln Memorial. There was a man who came back from the war after, after World War II, black man, um, who had a very unpleasant experience. And really that's how this relationship with Truman got started. Tell us that story. Um, this is the story of Isaac Woodard. Now, Isaac Woodard was a soldier in World War II. He was from a tiny town in South Carolina and he had spent three years overseas. He comes home to South Carolina. He's discharged. He gets his discharge paper that has the mimeographed signature of President Harry Truman on it, puts that in his pocket. He's got a little cash in his other pocket, and he goes to take a bus to see his wife and young children who he hasn't seen in three years. Um, he, at a stop, a bus stop in South Carolina, he asked the bus driver to use a bathroom because they would not have had a bathroom on the bus at the time. Uh, the bus driver spoke some words to Isaac Woodard and Isaac Woodard still wearing the army uniform and with you know medals on it, felt a little empowered and spoke back to the white bus driver. There was an altercation, there was uh, police and ultimately Isaac Woodard was beaten and he was blinded by the end of a billy club. Um, and his story, when he first shows up in Walter White's office at the NAACP in New York, he reaches out his hand as a blind man I uh, can't find Walter's hand to shake it. And Walter White realizes that this is a moment that can change America. And so he turns Isaac Woodard's story very much into something like what Black Lives Matter would do today. It's a cause celebrity. He gets celebrities on board. They have a, you know, they do national speaking tours. There's a big concert where Woody Guthrie plays. And um, ultimately when, when uh, Walter White goes to sit with Harry Truman, He's, you know, he tries to convince Truman that something has to be done. Nobody is arrested for the, the beating and the blinding of this American soldier still wearing the uniform. Uh, and Truman agrees. And he gets the um, Attorney General Tom Clark of Texas on board and they launch this investigation. And this is nothing like this had ever happened in America before, where finally it came to it that a white police officer had to stand trial for the beating of a black man. That had never happened. Amazing story. And that's the story that really got Truman's attention, as I understand it. That's correct. Yeah. Vanessa in Albion, do you have a question you'd like to ask? I want to ask, are there any modern white passing lobbyists that you're inspired by? Passing meaning, um, what do you mean exactly by passing? Um, that their skin tone appears more white than black? That's a great question, you know, and my, my honest answer is that I can't think of any um, off the top of my head. What I can say is that, you know, if we want to talk about all of the things that are happening today, um, it shocks me. The one thing I hear about people who read this book, they say to me, I didn't know anything about any of this. And, you know, that's a, that's, I didn't even know a lot of it. Um, and I think that there's wide gaps of history in our, in our country's history that we don't know about that it really informs everything that's happening with our political figures today, uh, with our politics, with race in America, um, that, uh, that people don't understand. So I, I have to say, I can't think of anybody off the time and, and answer, right now answer, to answer your question. But what I can say is that there's so much happening in our world today that can be so much better understood if we understand more about the past. That's why I majored in history, AJ. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Skylar? Do you have a question you'd like to ask of AJ? Yes, I do. Thank you, Ted. And thank you, AJ. We definitely feel like we've gotten a lot of good insights so far. Uh, one of the questions I just wanted to ask was um, how, if at all, any of your previous books or any of your previous works that you've done have either aided you or influenced you to write this book? 
Absolutely. And there's two ways I want to answer that. The easy way to answer that question is that Walter White, Walter Francis White was sort of a minor character in the last three books that I wrote. So every time I was researching a new book, I had to reread his autobiography and dig around on him and find out. And every time I did so, I was shocked. I'm like, why hasn't anybody write, written this guy's story? It's like, it's so crazy. You can't even believe it's true. And it's an important story in terms of understanding our history. So that's what happened. Like three books in a row, I kept coming across his story. But the other way I, I can answer that question is, um, I was, um, I thought my studies in college and, and ultimately graduate school, that was the formative time of my life. And um, I first learned about Walter Francis White in, in um, my first semester of graduate school. And I, I studied all of this stuff as a student. And I'm, I'm saying this because, you know, like there are things that are on your desk now, things that you're reading about now that are going to inspire you and you know they're going to come up later in ways that you can't anticipate that are really important. Um, and so all of a lot of the books behind me, a lot of the I, I went out and from that first semester of graduate school, I found all these books and these notes with my original notes in them um, that really helped set the stage for the writing of this one. So keep your books, keep your notes, and be ready to be inspired. Great advice. We're talking with A.J. Bame, whose latest book, White Lies, The Double Life of Walter F. White and America's Darkest Secret is available. It uh, just been out a couple months, getting great reviews. If I were writing book reviews, you would get a glowing review from, Thank you, from Ted. me. Uh, I really enjoyed, I really enjoyed your, your book. Um, I, I guess I would like to pursue a little more the relationship that emerged with Truman and, uh, and, and, um, and Walter White as the years went by through the rest of the Truman administration. Some of the things that happened, um, the March on Washington that didn't happen, that sort of thing. Excellent. Well, why don't we start by addressing the March on Washington? That was um, this idea uh, uh, at the beginning of World War II, FDR is still in office and Walter White comes to the uh, to the Oval Office to, to discuss um, a couple of matters. Along, he brings with him a guy named A. Philip Randolph, who's a fascinating character, very important um, black leader of this era. And they they're coming to argue for two things. Now, people have to understand a lot of a lot of readers today. It's very difficult to understand, but it's very easy to understand um, if you do a lot of reading. But you know, at the beginning of World War II, you have to imagine that. Black, most Black Americans had no opportunity to serve in the military and fighting units. Uh, they couldn't serve with white, uh, they couldn't serve in the Navy except as, um, you know, in the kitchen or making the beds of officers. Um, and it, it, at the end of the Great Depression, the war boom was creating thousands and thousands and thousands of jobs uh, for these factories that were tooling up to build military equipment. And at the end of the Great Depression, people needed jobs. Um, and Walter White was concerned, rightly, that all of those jobs were going to go to white people um, because there were a number of very large corporations who were getting huge military contracts from the federal government who had a policy not to, they wouldn't hire anybody who was African-American. So Walter and uh, A. Philip Randolph, they go to the White House and they sit down in FDR's office. FDR already knew why they were coming. And FDR was terrified. They were going to do this March on Washington with 100,000 people. Um, and he thought there might be a riot in front of the White House, a race riot. He thought that um, with uh, black people marching, that 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 people would think that FDR was an enemy of the black people, and no black people would vote for him. He was very concerned. So he meets with Walter and and A. Philip Randolph and says, "Hey, you got to call this off." And they refuse. And he says to uh, A. Philip Randolph, "How many people are going to march?" And Randolph says, hundred thousand people." And FDR turns to Walter and addresses him by his first name, Walter, how many people are going to march? And Walter says, Mr. President, 100,000 people. And two days later, FDR re releases these very famous executive orders uh, and saying, for that was the first time ever that there was a law that um, anybody, any company receiving a federal contract of any kind could not hire, could not discriminate in hiring. So, um, and there would be a fair practices board to make sure that companies were following the rules. This was a very important moment uh, for all of these people who, who needed, desperately needed work at the end of the Great Depression. And that's why you saw for the first time 
ever a lot of white people and black people working on the assembly lines together during World War II. Vanessa, question? Earlier, you mentioned the NAACP's first, uh, one of their first marches and the KKK marching as well. Did those marches happen at the same time? And if so, what were their interactions with each other? That's a great question. So the silent march, the NAACP's silent march, that occurred in 1917. And it was in response to a race riot in East St. Louis. Um, and again, that was sort of like, it was 1917 when the NAACP was really starting to come together and make news nationally. And that, that march had a lot to do with that. Now, the modern KKK was founded in a ceremony atop Stone Mountain outside Atlanta uh, in 1915 and quickly began to grow. And the picture I showed you of that rally in, in Washington, DC was in 1925. Um, but the thing I wanna illustrate is that particularly after war, war, World War I, the Great War, um, that's a, a time when um, African-Americans really started to organize and say, hey, we fought in the army. We fought, we, if, if we're expected to go overseas and risk our lives, we should be able to come home you know, we fought for democracy overseas, we should have democracy at home. And so there was a lot of white America who was not interested in that. And they were um, vastly informed by a movie that came out called The Birth of a Nation. And that's a 1915 movie that depicted black people as these horrible, horrible people who did horrible things. And the KKK as uh, knights in shining armor. And millions and millions and millions of Americans saw that movie, it was the first movie blockbuster, the first movie watched in the White House. Millions of people saw that movie and formed their opinions of what the KKK was. So at that time, um, the KKK opened, op operated openly in many places in American school boards, local governments, and uh, was really embraced. Um, but what you saw at that time was really this rivalry be forming between those two forces against each other. Now, this is the era of Woodrow Wilson, Birth of a Nation, yeah. uh, Wilson busily segregating the departments of the federal government. Uh, it was, a, it was a, a, a time fraught with problems that just kept manifesting themselves over and over. Skyler is shaking his head. Do you have a question? I do have a question. Yeah. Thank you, Ted. Um, so you kind of touched on this, AJ. You know, it seems like the biggest dilemma, I want to say, not the biggest, but a dilemma common amongst history studies and other things like that, is that the history of America seems to pick and choose the history that it wants to kind of relay and describe. Um, so it's so powerful writing a book on Walter White, whose history, like you said, before this really has been unknown. So can you kind of touch on like some of the biggest challenges that you faced, whether it was interpersonal, or just in general, uh, while writing this book? I really appreciate that question. You know, one way I can answer that is to say like, you know, um, even just to be talking about these really difficult issues with students like yourself, um, you know, it, it's not an easy thing to do because I don't know what's going on in your mind. I don't know what's going on in your parents' minds. I don't know what's going on in your teachers' minds. And they, they may, you know, we're reading a lot in our newspapers these days and other places about this exact issue. Um, and so, you know, I'm very aware to, it's terrifying to come out with a book like this at this time in our country's history, because there's going to be a lot of people who will be upset with, about it. Frankly, I understand that um, a lot of those people who would be upset about it aren't going to read the book. So there's that. Um, but you're, you're, what you're touching on is incredibly important. Somebody once said, I can't remember who it was, Ted, you might remember, that whoever controls the past controls the future. And that is something, uh, whoever controls the past controls the present and whoever controls the present controls the future. And, um, you know, there's so much talk about critical race theory today. And frankly, there's so much talk about it that I don't even understand what it is anymore. What I think people should be talking about is what actually happened in the past. And maybe that can inform us about ways that we can approach the future uh, in ways that are better for, for all of us, you know? And I'll say one other thing, this is getting complicated, but you know, the one question that confronts all political philosophies, all of them, 
is that what is best for an individual cannot always be best for the group. And what is best for the group can always, cannot always be what's best for every individual. And here in the United States of America, we have a population unlike any other in the world where we have all of these different peoples who came from different places and continue to come from different places. So um, it's an, an exceptional place. Um, and there's a, a lot that remains uh, in question and a lot of issues that we still have to figure out, you know, the best we can for the most of all of us. Hopefully that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense to me. You know, as you said, the first half of your book really talks about, uh, describes um, Walter's investigative work, posing mostly in the South, not entirely, uh, as a white man to find out what went on and coming back to New York and, and writing his reports. And those stories are ghastly. To me, it's frightening to think that those things happened in, in the century in which I was born. It, it's, it's absolutely incredible uh, that all of those things happened. And, and I thought that your treatment of them was, uh, was entirely appropriate because it shaped who this man was and, and where he went when suddenly in the, maybe not suddenly, but in the 1920s, after he was the executive secretary of the NAACP, shifted his focus and tried to make it an instrument of, of political power. Um, you wrote 1932 marked the emergence of the Negro voter as a force which no political party could longer ignore or flout. And that was a big change, I think, in, in his work, was it not? It was indeed. And let me point out that that, that quote, what you just read was actually, that's a quotation from Walter. Yeah, so, I, I, I misspoke, of course. No, that's was. okay. That's okay. Just because I, you know, one of the things you, a person like me has to be so careful about is, is um, what it, when to use the, you know, what words, because these words can be so very powerful. Indeed. Um, were there, were there times when Walter White posing as a white man was looked upon with disfavor by people of his own race? Yes. And that's an, a very um, interesting question. I think that um, the more famous that Walter became, uh, he was um, highly, highly ambitious. He could be manipulative. Um, and um, he, he, not everybody was impressed with him because he was so ambitious and uh, he could be an egotist. And um, one of the things that he wanted to do was bring attention to these investigations, not just because he was fighting for justice in America, um, but because he was a little self-promotional. And I think some people understood that. And, you know, in the book, you see him go head to toe in this horrendous rivalry with W.E.B. Du Bois in the 1930s, where these two guys are really going head to head. And one of them has to be cast out of the NAACP because the organization can't hold the two of them because they had come to hate each other so much. And that had something to do with it, yes. It, it, speak a little bit about W.E.B. Du Bois. That would be a great subject for another book uh, because he was a very interesting man, um, Harvard doctorate, um, uh, intellectual by anyone's standard with a, a strong personality. Would that be fair? A very strong personality. And somebody who, who um, you know, showing up at the NAACP office in 1918, Walter would have been terrified of Du Bois because he was so intimidating and so brilliant. He had written The Souls of Black Folk, which is people are still reading in college and graduate school today. Um, but just a monumental figure. And if you had to say that there was one person that was most uh, responsible for the founding of the NAACP, you would probably say Du Bois. I should point out, it's important to understand that when the organization was founded and during Walter White's days, it was, it was um, a biracial organization and that was very important. It wasn't a black organization, it was biracial. Most of the board of the directors were, were, uh, were white. When Walter started there, um, the chief executive at that time was John Shalady. And there's a moment where there's a chapter in the book where John Shalady gets beaten up and has a nervous breakdown and disappears. Uh, and that's the first time when James Weldon Johnson becomes chief executive that there's a black man uh, who was running the organization from the top. But um, Du Bois was the intellectual of his era. And um, one of my favorite books 
ever nonfiction is When Harlem Was in Vogue by David Levering Lewis. And he's actually quoted in the introduction to White Lies. Uh, but he wrote a two-part um, biography of Du Bois that won a Pulitzer Prize. So there's not much question about where to go to if you want to learn more about him. Yeah, a lot, lot to be learned too, uh, interesting. Um, I, I want to repeat for those of you who are watching, um, I, and if you have questions, you can certainly use the chat function of Zoom. We'll pass those on to, to AJ. I will now turn again to Vanessa at Albion College and see if you have another question for AJ. I do. You mentioned a scandal that impacted um, Walter's career at the end of his life. Would you be able to speak a little bit? Vanessa, that's a great question. Thank you for um, asking. Um, and the reason why I'm so glad that you asked that question is because we can come back to this thing that you know we started our conversation with, which is how is it that this man who is the most influential you know, civil rights leader of the first half of the 20th century, why don't we know anything about him today? Why, you know, and there's two reasons. One is because um, sort of midway through his life, uh, you know, he he becomes the face of black power. The irony is, is extraordinary. If you can imagine the face of black power at that time, you know. Uh, um, but he's married to a black woman and um, has a black, two black children, but he falls in love with a white woman. He meets her at a party in Harlem. And um, he, we believe, you know, that his physical relationship with her began in 1930 when his father died. And so as he's becoming more and more of a public figure, he has this secret love affair going on, which threatens to destroy him. Um, and late in his life, he left his wife. His, he started to have heart attacks. He knew he was going to die. And he wanted to um, die in love. And he left his wife for this white woman. And there was a shocking scandal um, that really destroyed his reputation. Uh, and that's a major reason why he died soon after he married her. And then he died just a few years later. Um, and that's the major, you know, a major reason why we don't people don't know who Walter White is because his he was cast aside. He, his legacy was destroyed while he was still alive. Um, the other re reason I think it's really important to point out is he died in 1955, uh, right at the time of the Montgomery bus boycott and the rise of Mar Martin Luther King Jr. and the beginning of this next generation of powerful, very obviously very important and influential civil rights leaders who really were not interested, especially in the new era of television. Uh, uh, of having this man be the sort of progenitor of their movement, have white skin and blonde hair, blue eyes. It wasn't going to happen. So soon after Walter died, um, his legacy, he was cast aside. And a lot of it, you know, sometimes people ask, I'll, I'll end answering this question here. Sometimes people ask me if Walter could come back, would he regret that decision to leave his family after, um, you know, with in history's hindsight, and who could possibly know? I don't have the slightest idea, but um, that was the scandal that destroyed him. And it did destroy. It destroyed his relationship with his entire family, as I recall. Yes, his son changed his name because he didn't even want you know white to be part of his name. You know, and that's one of the 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 subtitle of the book is the double life of Walter White. Um, and America's Darkest Secret. And Walter was living this double life all through his life, sometimes when it served him best and sometimes when he couldn't help himself. And I think that the, that was, uh, this was one of those times. One of our viewers at home said uh, that she had been learning, reading, as we all have, about banned books. Is there any concern on your part that White Lies might become a banned book? Um, I don't have any concern, but it wouldn't surprise me if it was. Um, and, you know, um, and if it is, I, you know, maybe it would surprise me, but if it is, that would be a sad thing. Not for, for me, not because I would miss out on sales, but just sad for people who um, are unable to confront truth in our, you know, in our past. I couldn't agree more. Thank you for putting it that way. Skylar, do you have a question? Yeah, I do. Thank you, Ted. Uh, I wanted to, and, and forgive me if you already mentioned this, but I don't think you did. Can you kind of touch on the inspiration of the title, White Lies? That's a great question. Um, 
you're never going to come up with a title that everybody loves. <laughs> and this one uh, we came up with because it is the whole idea of uh, a man who who was lying to for a purpose. You know, he's lying by posing undercover. Um, He's, he ends up, you later find out in the book that there's this, you know, quintessential moment of his childhood we talked about in Atlanta race riot, where he's holding a gun, uh, look, you know, wondering what it would be like to kill a man. And later, his family comes out and says, you know what, we don't think there was a gun there. And so he's sort of called out before his family on this, what it was probably a lie, we can't know for sure. But what I, um, and then there's the lie of him uh, being married and being unfaithful to his wife. And so throughout the book, one thing that you do see is um, this man being untruthful, oftentimes untruthful to pursue his goals, which are very, very noble, and other times not so noble because he was a, a flawed person. Um, so that was the sort of thinking behind it, that the idea that here was a person who was constantly lying, sometimes probably even to himself. It had to be a frightening life during those days of his investigations in the South. I would, I, I can imagine be terrified. Yeah, and he touches on that. So, you know, I was able to find moments where he's, he is terrified. He's lying and he realizes that if the truth comes out, you know, he would be tortured in, in ways in, in that he couldn't even imagine. Yeah, he would be treated as brutally as those whose... Right whose situation caused him to be investigating in the South, a beating, a death, whatever, terrible. You know, I, this is an incidental question, but I, I have to ask it because I'm amused by it. The, the book White Lies has on its cover a flagpole over a street with a, a flag on the flagpole says a man was lynched yesterday. Tell us about that flag. That is uh, the NAACP's headquarters. And uh, there's a certain moment, I believe it's in the, it's just after World War II, where there's this wave of violence against Black Americans, some, many of them who had just returned from war. And this was obviously very controversial because you had, uh, you know, African Americans fighting overseas for democracy and for justice and then coming home and having these things happen to them, being murdered in their own country. Um, and so at, 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 uh, at one point, there was this idea in the office to hang this flag outside the window every time that there was a lynching. And um, a lot of people, times people mistake the term lynch um, for hanging. It doesn't just mean hanging. It means, you know, uh, um, murder outside of justice in any way. Um, so they would hang this outside of, the, of, the, of uh, the office right there for all to see. So that's an actual picture taken from their office window of that flag with the streets of New York in the background. The landlord asked them to remove it and threatened to kick them out of their offices. And so there are not a lot of pictures of this flag because it did not exist for very long. <laughs> What's the NAACP's degree of influence today in light of the Black Lives Movement and all of that? And, and uh, do you perceive material differences and objectives from say from 1955 when, uh, when Walter died? Uh, I think the mission is, is you know, and, and I'm not an expert on this, so I'll just say that. But to me, what, you know, from my point of view, the mission is exactly the same. And what I would say that it, that it is, is justice for all Americans, not just some, democracy for all Americans, not just some, and an end to the color line. That's important. It should never be, um, it, it should never go into anybody's, you know, system of judgments, what color skin a person has. It, it's it's I feel like the the mission is simple now um simple in in terms of its directness let's say um I showed you a picture of Thurgood Marshall and um he was hired by the NAACP I think it was 1938 yeah. and he was already building uh the, these building blocks of education uh uh court battles so the first I think was a man named Gaines and he won this man named Gaines into uh, uh, the right to attend the University of Maryland Law School because um, Thurgood Marshall started out in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, and that was the beginning of it all, the fight for, um, to be able to um, give money and legal uh, assistance to people who wouldn't ordinarily have it. 
And that today exists, it's called the Legal Defense Fund, the NAACP's Legal Defense Fund. And I believe the Michigan mission is still the same. Um, and the key is, you know, for them, the key is having the money to be able to support all the people who need support. And um, so hopefully that answers that question. I'm gonna to read to you a question that was submitted just moments ago here, AJ. The following statement was made in one of the reviews of your book, and I'm quoting, I, I, I can't vouch for the quote, I assume it's accurate. Quote, if the life of Walter White is to provide a moral example, it should perhaps give a moment of pause that White's death was publicly mourned by J. Edgar Hoover and Richard Nixon, though not by his own children, close quote. Uh, this person said that they have selected the book for an upcoming book club uh, meeting, and this seems to be like a provocative question to ask the group. How would you answer it? Well, I think that's, a, that's an excellent question. And, um, you know, the, I think the way to, to answer that question is that Walter, and, and we, one of the reasons why we chose the title that we did is Walter White, Walter Francis White was far from a perfect person. Um, he was ambitious to a fault. He made huge mistakes in his life. Um, and, uh, he, and, you know, all, all um, for him, all roads end, ended at the White House. I think he, he thought that the corner office was the place where he was going to cause, you know, uh, the most change in America and the most fame for himself. Um, and that sort of, you know, overambition, I think, was part of his downfall. And um, it's an interesting quote. If I think it is accurate. I remember where it comes from and, um, and should be, yes, should be further discussed. He's far from a perfect person. Indeed. Well, we're in greater Detroit here. And so I have to ask you about Dr. Sweet, 1925, 1926, uh, the address on, on uh, 2905 Garland Street. I've been past the home. Tell us a little about that and, and the involvement of the NAACP. Sure, I knew that you would bring this up being a lawyer because uh, it's during this amazing case where Walter first meets Clarence Darrow and there's, a, there's an extraordinary moment of comic relief in that first meeting. Um, but you're addressing the, uh, the case of Dr. Sweet and his family. So in 1925, um, Dr. Ozian Sweet was a, uh, um, a very successful local doctor and he was black and he wanted to move his family into a nice new home and he had that money. Uh, to do so. Um, and there were threats even before he moved in, so he postponed the move. But by the time he got there, it's this first, first night there, and he had some brothers and sisters, and they had a 14-month-old child, his wife, and this child. And the first night they're there, a massive group of people shows up out in front of the house. The sun begins to set. Uh, stones begin to get thrown through windows. Uh, Dr. Sweet is concerned that he's going to be able to protect his own 14-month-old daughter and his and his wife. Some estimates say that there were 2,500 people standing outside his house um, and a shot was fired and a white man was killed and the police came and arrested Dr. Sweet, his wife and everybody else and took this 14 month old baby into custody. Um, very quickly after that, the Detroit office of the NAACP got wind and wrote these extraordinary memorandums to the, to the office in New York, which naturally I have um asking for for help but not specifically for help but specifically from Walter Francis White's help because they need an investigator they need someone who's going to get the facts and be able to prove facts and so Walter gets to Detroit and that's the beginning of this odyssey he realizes that they're going to need help um in court because uh, Dr. Sweet is going to go to court and Dr. Sweet has these two black lawyers and Walter says these lawyers are okay but there's no way no way in Detroit that an all-white jury is going to find these guys innocent uh, unless we get a white lawyer in there. And he he comes up with the idea to hire Clarence Darrow, who was the most famous uh, attorney of his era. And Clarence Darrow comes and they fight these, these cases. There's two of them. Uh, and they ultimately win and set up an important precedent that remains to this day. And that is that uh, a man should be able to protect, a, ma a man's home is his castle and he should be able to protect it. Um, so that remains a famous case in legal circles and there's a plaque there in Detroit. Um, you know, but there's a tragic ending in that um, during the time that they were imprisoned, 
Dr. Sweet's wife came down with tuberculosis. She gave the tuberculosis to the child. Both the child and Mrs. Sweet passed away. And Dr. Sweet lived on a very unhappy life and ultimately died of suicide. So they, they won this case, this tragic um, and very important court case. Um, it didn't turn out so well for, for the Sweets. Not at all. I had read about the Sweets and that. And when I read your book, White Lies, and read about Walter White's story in 1906, um, I, I had to draw the parallel between Walter and his father facing the people walking up the street past and to their home, uh, and how the Dr. Sweet and his family must have felt on Garland Street in Detroit many years later. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. I've forgotten. I think, Skyler, is it your turn to ask a, a question? We're, we're running short on time. I hope you have one. I can, I can, yeah. I, I do believe it was Vanessa's turn if she has a question, but I don't mind asking one as well. Well, we'll let you both do that. Okay, I, I can go ahead and start. Um, <laughs> I guess just one of the one of the last things that I, I wanted to kind of ask, and as we're coming to an end here, uh, can you perhaps reflect on, you, you touched on earlier that, you know, and it was one of the questions I asked you, that when reading this book, I definitely think that you probably have to keep an open mind. Um, can you kind of touch on like maybe just a final message that you would like to say or, or what impact that you hope, if any, that your book will, will have on people that read it? Uh, I, I just think that, thank you, great question. I just think, I think that if there's one takeaway from the book, it's that I hope people understand like everything going on in our world today. I think the great failure of all of us is the ability to communicate. Um, there's there's the Democrats and there's Republicans. There's the black and there's the white. And, and nobody can understand each other and make each other understand what the other is feeling and thinking and why they're behaving the way they are. Um, you know, I, I just give one random example. You know, I've heard so many people criticize NFL players for taking a knee. And I'm thinking like, you know, I can understand it, but nobody's communicating really well why they're taking an A. And I think if, if you know, anybody who's reading this book, um, maybe they'd understand better um, because, you know, the facts of history inform so importantly the things that are going on today and, uh, and will in the future, as we've said before. Vanessa? Um, I find it important for us to discuss and not just for us in like an educational setting, but for other people um, such as like a younger population to have access to um, books about historical figures such as white. And do you plan on promoting this book more towards um, teachers and people who have access to like school curriculums? Or is that not in your plan? That's a great question. And, and um, the best way I can answer that question is I really hope so. And a lot of the time, like those types of um, decisions, and specifically this book, because let's face it, it's a very controversial book, and it touches on some very, very touchy subjects that, you know, not everybody will be comfortable with, and I understand that. Um, but uh, it really turns out what, what happens, I think, is it's really incumbent upon um, professors and teachers and students who are, you know, there are places for them to find books like this and and hopefully they choose this has happened in the past where um you know my publisher will reach out to universities and say hey you know um and uh, one of my books did get picked up and i would start getting emails from you know students at duke university and other universities saying you know i'm writing a paper and i you know i just reach out to the other why not and i'm more i'm so excited when that happens because uh, not just because people are reading the book but because i can help you know, just add to it in any way in their experience of it. So my, my answer is, I really, really hope so, yes. It's a great question and a great answer. AJ, i just delighted you were able to join us tonight. Uh, this is a great way to wrap up our American Democracy Initiative conversations for the season. Uh, the book is White Lies, The Double Life of Walter F. White and America's Darkest Secret. It's only been out a couple months. Um, I meant what I said to you, but maybe I said it after we were all together, but I know I said to AJ uh, before we opened this to the public, uh, when I read the book, uh, I was sad that it ended and said to myself, I'm going to read it again. It, it's one of those books. And, and I don't say that about a lot of books. So thank you for the book, AJ. 
I'm and, so honored. Thank you, Ted. Thank and, you for and, everybody for being here. And thank you so much for being with us. Um, you can enjoy the rest of your day now in California, where it's what going on five o'clock. And uh, thank you very much, Vanessa, Skyler. Uh, good luck with the rest of your college career. Skyler, yours is very short, about three or four weeks, and you'll be done. Uh, thank you for being with us. Thanks to Eddie Visco for, uh, from the Ford Institute at Albion College for making, you, uh, uh, making arrangements for you to be with us. And AJ, thank you very much. And everyone, thank you so much for being with us for this series. I hope that we'll be back in the fall, and we'll see you then. Until then, good night.